Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This series is designed to give the year-round education on data strategy topics in addition to our annual face-to-face -face event from which we just returned. It was a great event this year and we're already underway for planning next year to be held in Atlanta, Georgia. This month, John Loudley and Kelly O'Neill will be discussing a compelling statement to corporate leaders why you must address EIN and DG. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO Vision. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce, introduce our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. Also joining us is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners. Having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management, Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today webinar started. Hello and welcome. And good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you may be, and thank you for joining us. Hello, Kelly, how are you? Hello, hello, everyone. I'm good. How are you? Oh, well, good. Uh, this is uh, going to be a really interesting talk today, so everyone that is on, sharpen your pencils, get your paper ready. You're going to hear a few things that you can use. Uh, and let's get started. Uh, why we're here today is we need to address leadership today and we need to address the mis messages that we get. A, a very common question uh, we get, right, Kelly, which is how do I start this? How do I sell it? How do I sustain this? How do I keep people engaged? And we've been examining that on and off and you'll see how here in a little bit for almost a year now uh, kind of as a, a side research project and, and we've got some ideas on the messaging and we're going to talk about that. The real root problem here is we think that a lot of what we're doing and a lot of where people's heads are are out of sync where we're ahead of the ability to absorb some stuff. So uh, we're going to have a practical message uh, for leadership, uh, very practical um, if uh, you were looking for something that will uh, wake them up, startle them, and get you fired. Um, you might not hear that today, but you're going to hear something that you may not have heard before. And we have a little vision uh, to develop that message that's uh, suitable for you that Kelly is going to go over. Uh, we are going to leave about uh, 10 minutes or so at the end for questions. And as Shannon said, please uh, submit your questions so we can go through those. Any questions we do not get to, we will address afterwards uh, uh, and answer in writing and uh, blog those answers too. Uh, we've done that at times as well. The contributors to this are more than uh, John and Kelly. About a year ago, this group of esteemed individuals started to talk on a phone on a regular basis about traction of data management, information management, and data governance. And you can see we have representatives there from Gartner Group, which is Doug, Danette McGilvery, uh, who has her own firm. Kelly and I from First San Francisco. James Price is uh, a, a brilliant fellow from Australia with his firm down there. And of course, Dr. Tom Redman, the data quality doctor. Um, and he's been uh, doing this work for a long time. And we've actually tossed a lot of things around, done some research, and we don't need to go into all that details. But a lot of what you're going to hear today comes out of some real serious thinking from a lot of uh, really, really smart people. And we thank them for their uh, time. So let's get moving here. Um, 
this is a bunch of reasons we do data projects. Um, and, and the results out of that might be MDM, it might be analytics, um, but these are business things that, that, that are happening to companies and are things they want to do with the data. These are the actions companies want to take from data. Now the issue arrives with what we're talking about here, and uh, I can ask Kelly to chime in on this one. Are these really one-off projects? or are these part of some type of a holistic strategy? And what we'd like to see is something a little bit more strategic, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing is sometimes, even if they are a one-off project, they can be a good indicator of what that strategic viewpoint looks like. Um, and maybe the current most urgent need that's part of a bigger uh, issue or problem that can be addressed as more of a philosophy. Absolutely right. And so, I mean, that's at the crux. Uh, what are the, these are the business reasons, but you can still do a one-off data project or something that's more holistic, or you can approach these holistically and, and uh, you know, you can uh, act global and think local. There's lots of ways to do this, but the issue is at the end of the day, we have to help companies do these, the, these things with our work. Uh, but the message we deliver is not quite being received because what we hear and when we'll, what we see this is when, when we see an organization that is truly engaged with, with uh, uh, the data management world um, um, and, and those types of things, what we see is, is a company where, where they want to do data right. All right? I mean, and that's kind of a, 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 a different, um, a, a, an easy way to say that, uh, data driven. Um, but they also were talking about the value of their data, and, it's, and uh, we had great interest at Enterprise Data World on, on how do we actually come up with metrics to, uh, to measure the contribution of our data. Those organizations have chief data officers or a top data job. They really take deliberate alignment of their business, and they put culture and business alignment before the technology. <clears throat> and there are many, many examples of success, and we're going to talk about when someone is successful, what's going on versus unsuccessful in a little bit. The ones that are not, aren't engaged, they're doing data projects, but what we notice is they apply it directly to a project. If we start to talk holistically, they go, we can't handle that, it's not us, it's, we're not ready for it, or you hear it's too abstract. Um, we're seeing places that are hiring chief data officers and top data jobs and then getting rid of them within a year or turning them over because they've given them impossible tasks to do. Um, you get to just do it, give me access to all the data type stuff, and, 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 and the big symptom here is technology before culture. Uh, people are buying the tools and buying the technology before they've even addressed any of the organizational aspects. And as um, uh, Drucker said, uh, culture will have strategy for lunch. And a lot of organizations are learning this uh, the hard way. But the message isn't quite being received because we've got a real dichotomy between successful organizations and organizations that are struggle. And this is a, a summary of what we see in, in, the, in those two things. So then, you, of course, you want to do a root cause an analysis here, right? If you're going to, if, uh, for, uh, what is at the um, a core of, of, of things? Well, it's a lack that this stuff is really important. But what creates that? Well, leadership and management doesn't feel they've got justification for it because they're not going through the right steps. They're not doing things for the business, they're doing the technology projects. Uh, things aren't being enabled. Uh, uh, to support this, um, uh, you do a big MDM project and you're supposed to have a, a, a good stable set of standards and some governance to make it successful and we find that the data governance is pushed to the side or it takes a local project level flavor versus an enterprise flavor. Uh, and lastly, an operating framework or an engagement model. Uh, you're a steward, go off and be a steward, here's a book, be a steward. And, and that's not how to do data governance, all right? You, you've got to have, you've got to engineer some type of communications uh, model. There's a lot of root causes uh, with, with, within those, um, but this kind of uh, summarize it. Uh, Kelly, anything to add to that before we start to dive into some of our data here? I think maybe just to call out specifically 
data quality is not a root cause or a barrier. And so I think that that might be just something to explicitly call out here is that the challenges that we're facing aren't rooted in, you know, data. They're rooted in organizational issues. They're rooted in justification and business cases yeah. and business sponsorship and all of that. So just wanted to make that obvious. <laughs> no, and I, that is a really good point. You know, what is missing from this slide? What is missing is data quality. What is missing is easy access to data. You know, those those are requirements that we have to meet to be successful. Absolutely. Those, those aren't the root causes. That's okay. And 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 for those of I said keep your pencil sharp and your paper handy, that's something to write down. All right. Those are requirements. What most people have driving them as as a goal or an objective is a requirement. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, you've got the, this messaging we're going to talk about has to address these root these uh, these root root causes. So let's go into some of the research behind this. And and there's a concept called diffusion, and we're all familiar with it, even if we don't know the name. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But first, Kelly's going to talk about um, how you get an organization to act different. And because that's kind of what we're talking about here. And I'm going to uh, let Kelly have the floor here for a slide and a half or so. And uh, so take it away, Kelly. Great. Thanks, John. Yeah, so what we're, what we're trying to think about is truly how do we act differently and what's driving this behavior or lack of behavior, right, that we have uh, that is impacting our ability to progress these data pro programs. And as John talked about, both within First San Francisco and with the group of other thought leaders that we participated with, that we, are, we always come back to the why. Why is this hard? Why isn't it happening? Why isn't this you know, so difficult. And so I wanted to pull in a thought process from a man named Dan Barnett. And Dan Barnett uh, has a um, business consulting organization that helps companies to achieve their most optimum results. And I thought that this concept was really pertinent to the way that we think about data because one of the biggest blockers is our culture. So how do we drive the culture? Well, ultimately, Culture is based on the way that people believe and behave within their organization. So culture is that conglomeration of beliefs, behaviors, activities, unspoken norms um, that, that show how an organization uh, both responds to their employees as well as they respond to their uh, clients. And ultimately, beliefs are really what drive everything. And the way that people believe about their company is how leads to how they behave. And there's a lot of research behind this. And, and one of the things that gets, you know, John and I excited is it starts to get a little bit more um, interesting when we look into these root causes. So this research is based on a series of experiments that were done by a variety of universities, but they were all published in a Harvard Business Review article called Decisions and Desire. And essentially, they uh, applied electrodes to these uh, uh, people's brains that are uh, part of the um, experiments to see what parts of the brain become active when they make decisions. And they found that the limbic system which is your kind of your animal brain. It's the most primitive part of your brain. It is where all of your fight and flight uh, activities and how your, um, I guess, unplanned responses occur. So your decisions are made both in your limbic system and in your neocortex. And your neocortex is that human part of your brain that we all think about as what makes us different. It's our planned behavior. It is our... Um, predictive movement and proactive movement, not automatic movement. It is uh, where we think that we make all of our important strategic and analytical decisions. But what they found is that it's actually between your limbic system and your neocortex. So that means when we make a decision, we're actually calling into some of these things around fight or flight. Anyway, the idea is that this link between your uh, limbic system in your neocortex shows that our most inherent behavioral responses are also where we keep our beliefs. And our core beliefs drive our behavior in a very, very real way, not just from an external way, but the way that our brain processes these, transaction, these uh, um, transmissions in our brain. 
Therefore, if we want to impact culture, we need to impact our beliefs. And this is kind of where we got back to, okay, so how do we impact the beliefs around data? And so this is a lot of what has led up to this conversation is trying to impact the belief system that occurs within a company around data as well as uh, just within the industry as a whole. So the takeaway from this slide is that your beliefs drive your behavior and your beliefs and your behavior together create the culture. And if we don't address the beliefs, the behavior, and the culture around data, we will never get to the results that we want, and focusing just on the results is going to be a non-productive exercise. So what we're going to talk about now is kind of diffusion of beliefs, behaviors, and culture. Yeah, so, exactly. Yes. And so now I'm going to turn it back to you, John. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, are, <laughs> are you done? Uh, I'm done just because I think that you're much more um, knowledgeable about the Gartner uh, <laughs> okay. hype cycle, and it's another application of how diffusion occurs and the way that people believe around um, technology and how they adopt it. Yeah, and, and, and something to tell our, our audience here is, is these two things are connected because now someone's going, wow, this is this really cool thing about limbic and neocortex, and now I'm looking at the Gartner hype cycle, and, and, that, and someone's elbow just slipped off the table with that. But they are connected, and here is why. First of all, if we take a topic like analytics, where everyone says we're going to be data-driven, we're going to do analytics, and then you understand that even with all of that perfect analytics, most business decisions have are a factor of a very different process than what we saw here. Uh, you go, okay, then maybe we have to learn how to be data driven. The other thing we have to learn is, 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 is in terms of adopting data management and data governance, which is our topic here, what's that message is, we've tried to measure this before. So we have these, what, what, what in hindsight seem to be limbic because they're measures of behavior. There, there's, there is no uh, engagement here. This is, these, are, these are great tools. These, we're not disparaging the tools at all here. They are terrific ways of, these are terrific metrics. Uh, one great adoption uh, thing is, is the Gartner hype curve, and we all love the trough of disillusionment. I just, you know, I wish I'd invented that. That's just really cool. But it talks about how things ebb and flow until a new idea gets uh, stable, but we're measuring the reactions to this, and, and, and the reactions to this, remember, as we talked about, are a function of two parts of the way people do things. We also have the famous uh, uh, adoption curve, which was set out by Everett Rogers. You have your innovator, early, early majority, late majority laggards, and then that, that came out in the late 70s, 80s, and then Jeffrey Moore in his uh, um, classic business book, Crossing the Chasm, um, uh, took that and, and you know, when, when do you go from early adoption to the early majority? That's when something really takes off. So people say, oh, that's great. That's when we've adopted the technology because we've gone from early adopters to early maturity. The thing is, when you look at the Gartner hype cycle, when you look at these, you're looking at a historical thing. It doesn't tell you how to do that. It just tells you what you've done and what the, how events might pan out. So it, it, what we've got to do is move ourselves to a process of, of what's going on at these various phases. Because there's one thing that all of these both uh, leave out. When you have an innovator and an early adopter, or you're at the beginning of a hype cycle, somebody always has a success. And somebody takes that success and then becomes an innovator and then an early adopter says, I can do that, and they do that. And then the early majority says, well, we can do that, and they do that, and et cetera, et cetera. What makes within each one of these steps, whether it's the hype cycle or the diffusion curve from Rogers, what makes success? Where do people engage in the idea? And our esteemed group has started to kick that around, and we did some research and found another set of ideas. And I hope, I hope I'm not make anyone sleepy here, but we're going to touch this really quick and then move on to the juicy stuff. And there's another group of research called the Technology Acceptance Model. And it is based on 
shifting your idea from feelings to action and moving your, your thinking into a more methodical way. So you perceive that things are useful, but then you actually engage in a new technology or a new system or a new approach. And this is more what we would think a rational type uh, measurement of how people do things. So in terms of adoption, it's not an adoption curve, that's a look back. What we need is to master the diffusion of an idea in your organization, no matter what maturity or part you are. If you're a laggard, fine. If you're an early adopter, fine. But it doesn't matter. You still have to go through a process to think more analytically and think more about data. It, you just don't install a bunch of rows and columns or, 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 or structures and have answers stick to your face and expect yourself to be able to deal with them. There's some things that have to uh, uh, occur. Some things have to change. Um, all innovators go through an acceptance process, as do all others on the adoption curve. The intent is to go from idea to practice, no matter where you are. At the bottom of this little matrix here, we have our innovator through laggard, uh, which is the diffusion model from Rogers. But we also have the, T, the technology acceptance model up the left, where something triggers you and then you actually use it. And I can put an X in every box on that matrix and find somebody out there in data governance and data management land that's done something in that box at that level of maturity and that intent and adoption of an idea. So you need to address acceptance of the idea no matter where you are. Here's, a, here's the next thing to write down with your sharp pencil to Mr. Message. It doesn't matter that your organization is a laggard. All right, it doesn't matter that your organization is, a, is, is an early adopter or an early majority. It doesn't matter. You won't be successful unless you work diligently to get people to use the material that they've got. And it isn't a matter of turning it on and telling them Monday morning it's ready to go. It takes a little bit of work. Um, we actually did a little bit of a survey amongst our peers. Uh, we picked out um, our contributors, the six people we talked about, um, a few other folks we know, um, and then uh, uh, some people that we just said, you know, take this and, and tell us what you think. This is not an exotic survey. Actually, at the end of the presentation, during questions, I will show uh, an example of the actual survey. Um, but what it is, it's, it's measured the acceptance of an idea. And to make it easy on people, we made it in a, an urban planning model. So if you're going to adapt data governance, all right, and your organization is a, is a pioneer, all right, how, what that would be a, a, an intensity of, of embracing the idea of like a one or something like that. Uh, if it gets more, if you're a more mature organization, uh, how would you adapt it? So we asked a series of questions and look how this is skewed. This is skewed way to the pioneer refugee settler people who think that their embarking on this is going to be a struggle, that it's going to take an extraordinary amount of work. Now, how do you sell that idea to management if you say, we've got this great idea, we're going to build a civilization, but it's going to take 100 years and, and, and have enormous costs and use an enormous amount of resources. We have to get people to think more as this is more of a community building or an urban metaphor. So you've got to change people's thinking. And, and this is from people who know this business answered it this way. So you see, we've got some strong evidence here that we just got to kind of change the way we think. Um, we have to move to data driven. We have to think data driven. We have to think using data. All right. We just can't think about projects. We, you know, the projects might even be getting in the way. Someone told me that the secret to a really good golf swing was ignore the golf ball, then put the golf ball down and let the golf ball get in the way. We're, you know, we're probably thinking about something like that along here, uh, too. So what is the, the, the process here? Um, uh, Kelly's going to walk us uh, through uh, our, our five-step process, and, uh, and then we're going to uh, dive back in uh, uh, you know, for the next, you know, uh, 15 minutes or so, she's going to go over the process, and then we'll have uh, uh, the messages, and then we're going to dive into your questions as to how we might be able to uh, to help you here. So, uh, Kelly, take it away. Great. Okay. So we're going to go back to this thought process of uh, changing 
beliefs and behavior starts with change in culture. And the way that we want to think about this is creating a vision of how data will move your company forward. So I know that we've all done vision statements in the past. We've all done mission statements in the past. And this is just a way to consider the importance of doing a vision process and creating a vision statement to really abide by it and help drive your belief and your culture. And the idea is you want to have a vision statement that is crisp and it is resounding, it has a business purpose, and it is already aligned with some of your other cultural norms. And that vision should start to appeal to the belief system and to the limbic system and help people to respond. So this is just an example of a vision statement here in which the organization uh, plans to, to be leveraging data for competitive advantage. And this is a vision statement that fit nicely within their company culture because they had a competitive culture. They were very externally market focused. They wanted to be the best of the best. And so bringing in this concept of competition and competitive advantage pulled in the limbic system and help to drive this belief that data actually does help with their competitive advantage, along with other things. But data has a role in the way that they compete, just like some of their other behaviors and beliefs. So starting with a vision that is compelling and plays to the belief system is a great way to start. The vision then starts to be more further articulated in, uh, as John introduced, kind of a five-step process. The vision is then turned into a clear picture of what the future looks like and a picture of what it means once that vision uh, is starting to be accomplished. That picture helps to engage people and help them to understand where they're headed that picture, of course, also pulls in things like um, principles and uh, other sorts of behavior aspects that we've all done before in the sense of creating those guiding principles. Through the vision and the picture, the picture also informs the plan. That plan might be your roadmap. It might be your um, uh, uh, strategy, but the plan then helps people understand what are the steps that we're going to take in order to, to get to the picture and to accomplish our vision. And then the participation articulates what the individual roles are within the delivery of the plan. Now, one of the things that, that on this kind of infographic we had down at, at the bottom is the purpose. The purpose and the vision do uh, I guess align tightly together because the vision is the statement of that um, aspirational goal and the purpose is the why. Why are we doing this? So together the vision and the purpose to, should have that sort of limbic response that uh, helps people to believe that this is a very compelling program within the organization. And then the picture plan and participation spells it out in a bit more detail. So this is a thought process of how we start to address diffusion, adoption, however we want to think about it, but we're addressing it from the, its very base nature or the belief system, not just addressing it down at the end result, which tends to be the plan and the participation. We're, we're taking a step back and looking at it from the vision and the purpose and the belief system. So if we go to the next slide, this kind of links this process of the vision, purpose, picture, plan, et cetera, into exactly where it hits the beliefs and the behaviors. So your vision and your purpose, what is your big, you know, I don't know if anybody uses the term BHAGs or your big, hairy, audacious goal or another organization I've heard, um, uh, the WIG, the wild, inspirational goal, or any sort of high-level strategic statement of a goal that helps to inspire people is your vision statement. And then the purpose is why that uh, big, audacious goal is going to be compelling for the organization. So those two together help to address the limbic components in terms of uh, those core beliefs of why we're doing this. Behavior is then addressed in a, a bit more of the why. 
So the picture of the future state, the principles that articulate um, how people are expected to behave, the plan in terms of uh, exactly what are those steps within the roadmap, et cetera, and then who participates in the plan? How does it in involve the rest of the organization? By addressing from this perspective, then we can start to look at the results. Those results are, of course, how we impact the business as a result of the EIM program. But again, when we're trying to think about adoption and diffusion, rather than starting with the results, which we have all done, by the way, including John and myself, <laughs> we do want to take a step back and consider how that vision, purpose, and therefore belief system can better help us drive to the results, not just looking at that end state or the results. So this is kind of a five-step process to get to that core limbic uh, decision-making process. Any, any thoughts on that, John, or? Are you on yeah. mute? First, one must unmute to, to articulate <laughs> one's, one's beliefs and behaviors. Um, That's right. There's, uh, um, uh, so just so just to tie this kind of our topic of, of messaging here today, and, and again, something for the sharp pencil. Uh, and the paper. There's a couple of really key things here that um, have been bandied about as optional, uh, but the more and more we get into this and talk about it and research, and uh, again, this group of six people that we've been working with, we've got more to do here. Uh, we've got some more uh, things to come up with and, and, and all of that, so we're um, we're kind of mid-course on this, but, but there is definitely things we're sharing right now. So a couple of things that are definitely worth sharing. Things like principles. If you're going to get people to think differently in an organization, whether it's on the one project, go back to our little thought bubble slide, uh, slide two or three, and um, I'm sorry, that was slide four, uh, and, uh, and either think holistically or not holistically, but still do things intelligently around data. You've got to shift their thinking from reacting to a requirements perception and coming up with a data behavior or a data practice is sometimes the word uh, that is used. What we've seen, when you have something about beliefs, then what goes along with any belief system, regard, even outside the realm of data, any other type of belief system, you have principles and you have vision. Um, uh, so the emphasis here is uh, to uh, pit, you know, weigh in on this slide with Kelly. I cannot stress the importance of principles enough here. I cannot stress the importance of vision. Even if you are doing a data-centric initiative and you don't have the luxury of an enterprise oversight, but you still want to use this as a laboratory to better manage your data, do principles. Without principles, you have no philosophical anchor for a change in belief. And you're changing beliefs that, you know, data is, is something out there that we deal with to something that's really, really central to how we do business. You've got to have those principles. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, uh, uh, who does what, the vision, these are all extremely important. And we have lots of methodologies, right? We have maturity models and all of that. But if you really want to boil it down to the strong message, which is what our presentation is for uh, here today, it's, it's this simple shift uh, from a, an, an incorporation of beliefs and behavior uh, into uh, being, data, being data driven on that. Um, uh, uh, ready to go on the next one there, uh, Kelly? Yeah, so I just want to, I guess I said this already, but I just want to have everybody on the, on the phone reconsider how they're using their vision statements, how you're using your principles, because you've probably all done an aspect of this already. So how would you align what you've currently done back to this concept of driving adoption via beliefs? And just consider, should we take an opportunity to update these? Maybe what we've written is correct and action-oriented. We just need to be using them in a different way. So just as you're thinking about it, consider that perspective as well. Okay. Uh, now let's see. I am. So we have kind of the two ways to drive the messages. 
two different outlooks here, and Kelly and I, uh, Dr. Larry Bridge, got to just talk with this one together. There's the top-down way, and uh, James Price, one of our contributors, phrases it, you know, engage leaders with a passion for data. So let, let's talk about that. I think the word passions is important, don't you, Kelly? Exactly. Again, going back to our, our beliefs and our limbic system, if we're passionate about it, uh, it's, it's important, right? It starts to drive our behavior. Absolutely. And um, uh, James has uh, several wonderful case studies of clients he's worked with. Or he's had fabulous success and achieved measurable business results through information management. Uh, we don't see them a lot because he does work in another hemisphere, uh, but uh, some of his work is, uh, is, is fabulous. Now, uh, Dr. Redman, another one, he introduced this concept at EDW, and it went over very well. Uh, more of a bottom-up type thing, the provocateur. I, I like that. I mean, it sounds mysterious, provocateur. I am a data provocateur. Um, I don't know if you put that on a resume or not, but it's, it's you know, the provocateur is someone who instigates change, right? Um, and we do see organizations that do, do accomplish some bottom-up. Uh, type of things, or they take a project and do something really cool data-wise with it and then attract some attention and uh, do that. But now the provocateur has to be a risk taker too. Uh, they have to push things a little bit. That's why they're a provocateur. Um, uh, but that is another way uh, uh, to look at this kind of thing. Now, I will tell you right now that our group hasn't determined if one or the other should dominate, or it should be both, or it should be 60-40 or 70-30. We're still working on that. Or there's some middle out option here, too, that there might, uh, might, might be a as well. But here's kind of two ways to look at how these messages can be delivered and how they... Uh, how these messages uh, uh, can flow. Anything else on that one, uh, Kelly, or move on? Yeah, and, and I would just say, you know, think about what would work within your organization. Maybe you have a bottom-up program that's happening right now, and maybe you're trying to determine, you know, is this valuable? Can we get this done as a bottom-up? Well, this is a great perspective. Think about this, you know, organization as provocateurs to help drive this. Or maybe you've got a top-down approach where, where your uh, CEO has hired a chief data officer and you're trying to figure out how to drive a top down. So based on your existing program, where are you and how can you leverage either one of these outlooks to help get the end result that you're looking for? Okay. All right. So actual delivering the message and just really just two or three more slides here, but these are going to, uh, we're going to be talking about these a little bit here. Uh, first, reality. Kelly, this is the reality of what's going on right now, right? Yes, whether we like it or not, it is. Yep. Carry, yeah. Carry so on. You want me to carry? Okay, no problem. So we've got internal pressures, we've got external pressures. And, um, you know, a lot of times we think about those external pressures as uh, negative, but in fact, they're actually catalysts that can move the, organ the um, data program forward, such as regulatory compliance and increasing regulatory compliance, right? Um, that is, you know, the greatest provocateur <laughs> that we have, right? The secret is, of course, moving beyond regulatory uh, compliance, but we do have a great external driver from that experience. We have great external drivers in terms of our demanding customers. Um, I think that on that uh, infamous slide four or, or whichever one with the thought bubbles, one of the big drivers of doing a data program is improving customer experience across multiple channels, right? So our clients are getting more demanding, our internal employees are getting more demanding, and the technology, like it or not, is giving us new opportunities to either uh, push our data external to our firewall, keep it in-house, update some old legacy systems, et cetera. And all of this is being uh, managed while you still have to keep the lights on internally and you've got other sorts of internal pressures as well, uh, both from a technology perspective and as well as the way that you're looking at how you manage your products and your and your customers. So it is actually kind of a nice time to start thinking about this because we've got a lot going on that will force the organization, whether they like to or not, to start to address data as one of those key assets that informs a lot of the decisions around uh, how you manage both your internal operations and your external go-to-market. So I have a story to kind of show what's happening here. We have several 
uh, clients that are um, or or organizations we speak and communicate with uh, as well that are addressing the Internet of Things, and we all probably know that the Internet of Things is 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 we if we think we have a lot of data now, oh my goodness, right? Just look what's coming, and this uh, uh, organization wants to address, you know, and set up, has already set up its team for the Internet of Things um, and are starting to see uh, the overwhelming uh, technology challenges uh, that they're going to have. But what they really haven't talked about and, and we've uh, got to work with them about is is what do you do with it? It's not just one thing to say, well, the Internet of Things is the next really cool tech that's coming down the road and we can do cool things with it. What what can we do with it? You know, big data kind of started out as, as, as a third generation data mining analytics and we had an idea what to do with it. The Internet of Things is one of those, is a classic laboratory for what we're talking about here today. Whether you're an early adopter or you're going to be a laggard, you're going to be addressing this, whether you're a consumer of that data or a creator of that data or you're forced to deal with it for competitive pressures. You are going to be in the data business pretty much end of discussion if you're a big company here pretty soon. And it's it's going to be a real challenge. And if you don't accept that reality, uh, wow, I, you know, I, you know I, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're just going to you're spend an awful lot of money, I think. Uh, but, you know, that's it. So, you know, let's talk about the message that we want uh, want to give. Um, uh, and Kelly and I are going to kind of tag, tag team on this because of that prior slide. First of all, it is all data now, isn't it? That prior slide, Kelly, it's all data. What what really is there right now that isn't data? If, you know, it's hard pressed to think right. of something. Yeah, and no. I think, you know, you may think that your company produces widgets. Well, guess what? To understand your most operationally efficient way to produce the widgets, to understand your most effective way to sell your widgets, all of that is data. So regardless of whether you're a, you know, you produce like hammers, you are, it's all going to be about data in terms of optimizing that process. Yeah. And by the way, there is such a thing manufactured that is truly a widget. And um, I think we should probably check to see if uh, there is uh, some Internet of Thing technology associated with uh, widgets. It's used inside uh, cans of uh, a, a certain popular draft beer to create the bubbles. And it's called a widget. And I that's perhaps, your next uh, graphic uh, that's my next, um, project. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the next research project is we're going to have That's to right. uh, examine a lot of widgets. But the key here is right. data, is, is, your, your, your problems are solved now and, and your opportunities are grabbed with data. There's no such thing. So for the sharp pencil and the paper, message to the executive, uh, you know, show me something without data and show me something that we can continue, that we can be successful if, if data is in everything we're doing. And, and then we contrast how we treat our data now, then tell me how we're going to be successful here. And that's compelling, okay? Um, the intensity and the sincerity of, 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 of this uh, idea uh, of, of data, you know, um, uh, is it thought out? What's the business value? Do you have the stamina? And I, that we, we changed the word on that. Uh, when we were doing this presentation. I, I, I used another word. I, I started to use willpower. But it's more than just will. It's, it's, not, it, it, it's uh, like training for the marathon. You might have the willpower to do it, but you still have to build yourself up to be able to execute. Right, Kelly? Absolutely, and I think that, that part of what we want to address with this word, because I do agree it's an important word, is in the same way that we think about that adoption curve and where you have the, the trough of disillusionment, well, that trough of disillusionment occurs within your own EIM program or data governance program or even like a master data management or data quality program, whatever information program you're, you're doing, you have a high likelihood of hitting a trough of disillusionment. And so rather than abandoning the program, do you have the stamina to continue to keep going based on the belief that this is going to be a competitive differentiator for your company, for example? So it is 
truly the stamina to get beyond some of these obstacles and not throw up your hands uh, and say it's all too hard or we have better ways to uh, spend our money that is a bit shinier and spends faster and all of that. Yeah, I wonder how many of our listeners have been in an organization or participated in an effort where data management or data governance hasn't been quite successful. There's disillusionment around it. And then something else happens and they have to do another initiative that requires similar activity, but you get the word, and I am pretty sure if we had a poll facility set up, we could take a poll right now, and that is how many of you are not allowed to use a word like data governance anymore or data management or 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 data warehouse because you had a project that failed. And, and instead of stamina to get through it, um, you just don't use the word anymore, right? Uh, we're not going to do it anymore. Think of another way to use it. Use a different word, which, of course, confuses people and, and things like that. That's what we're talking about here. Um, uh, uh, and again, those diffusion curves, uh, the, the uh, Gartner Group, um, Hype Cycle, and the uh, Jeff, um, the, the um, Rogers diffusion curve, they're all valuable. You, you, you will have these things happening in markets and happening in technology. And what is your will to get through those uh, particular phases here. Um, so here's the message, and, and um, uh, I'm going to just going to deliver it and allow Kelly to expand on it, and then uh, we'll kick it back uh, uh, to me for uh, the questions, and then I can show the survey while people are asking the questions. I have a couple of questions here uh, already. I'll start with the first one, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Doing nothing about data management or data governance is not an option. Simple as that. Just sitting there isn't an option. Kelly, I think you have to either make a conscious decision and accept the risk that you're not going to mess with it, or you're going to mess with it at a project level, or you're going to embrace it. Thoughts on that? Absolutely. And I think that when the you know, when the audience, when you're coming up with this, oh, we need budget to do this, we need budget to do that, consider the cost of doing nothing. Because there will be a cost to your organization of not addressing your data, whether it's addressing data quality, whether you're addressing your governance and protection, whether you're addressing your data management processes, doing nothing ultimately has a cost to it. And that cost actually grows exponentially over time. Whereas the cost of actually addressing a problem early on, that actually reduces the cost over time of managing that data. And so it, it truly is whether you accept the risk to do nothing or you accept the cost or the um, process to establish a discipline. Um, and in most industries, doing nothing is truly not an option and will cause the organization to become non-competitive or to have some sort of regulatory compliance issue uh, that then obviously uh, creates other problems within the organization. And the other thing is, is uh, this last bullet point I think is really, really important and it was one that, that um, John came up with. This concept of waffling sometimes is just as dangerous as doing nothing because waffling also creates some cost and going back and forth of, well, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, that sort of thing, that also creates a cost. Now, I'm not saying that you have to invest, you know, billions, of, you know, millions of dollars from the outset, but just doing nothing is a cost. And yeah. if you're trying to calculate why we should do something, calculating a cost associated with that lack of action is just as relevant. And uh, Waffling has a finer point on it. When, when, when an organization says, well, you know, we're considering our options about this data management thing, but in the meantime, continue doing things. Uh, you, 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 the organization put in, in a very uh, precarious position of making assumptions. And those assumptions are invariably going to cost you more money. So, um, so you know, the message here is pretty simple. Make a call, Mr. Executive. Mrs. Executive, make a call, all right? Either make a conscious decision and accept what we are now documenting as profound risk. You know, no matter what kind of organization you are, then make a call to try to embrace this idea and get people to function and engage at a higher level with data-centric type work, governance, management, BI, analytics, 
whatever it is, uh, make the call to make it a more holistic cultural thing or keep it at a local level and uh, take a look at it again and accept the interim risks and document those interim document those uh, interim uh, risks. Um, and um, we're right at our time for our questions. So we'll just do our next uh, our next CDO vision series is June 9th. It's a CDO interview. Kelly, we have the person yet? Have we confirmed? I think we have. Absolutely. And so, you know, one of the one of the reasons that I'm excited, and I didn't want to interrupt in the beginning, but when we were talking about uh, some of the, the opportunities and challenges and the fact that there's been a lot of turnover from a CDO perspective, we have the confessions of a previous CDO on our next um, webinar. And John Bottega, who was one of the very first chief data officers ever uh, identified, promoted, given the you know ultimate opportunity, is going to be with us talking about how to make the role of the chief data officer successful and what he's learned over the past in terms of successes and failures. So I'm really excited to have him participate and to address this issue of, uh, you know, the, I think we called it the top data job turnover. Why is there a lot of turnover and what can you do to prevent it? Cool. And so it's John Bottega, next one. And it's also June 2nd is the first Thursday of the month. That is a typo on yes. my part. Um, it's really June 2nd at 9 p.m. No, it's actually June 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on this uh, webified uh, broadcast channel. Um, off to the questions now. Um, uh, Kelly and I will both take this one. It might take us a few minutes. Uh, by the way, if you have a question, please shoot it in. We've only got a few here. I know there's more than that out there and uh, um, uh, send them in. But I have a question right now here from uh, Ragu, and it is, we are doing the standalone type uh, governance and data management with many projects and many initiatives. Uh, what is some advice to start to bring those together? Uh, Kelly, I'll kick that to you, and then I can follow up. So uh, it's always hard to answer questions if I can't ask a question about the question. But anyway, so what I'm assuming this means is that the standalone governance is project-based governance, where you're looking at data uh, issues on a project-by-project -project basis. And so to me, this sounds like one of these bottom-up sort of grassroots sort of um, processes, which is okay, by the way. But maybe you can start to see some synergies across those different standalone initiatives and you can identify economies of scale and how those standalone initiatives can start working together uh, more coherently. And through taking a look at those consistent activities, consistent practices, and, and how they are addressing consistent data issues, you can start identifying where you want to create this concept of a vision and a purpose and that sort of thing. And it might be very fundamental that your vision for data governance is to, uh, you know, optimize um, efficiencies in your organization. And your purpose is to reduce costs by 30% of all uh, new project initiation um, for because of data. So you, you can still have a vision that is compelling and it doesn't have to be grandiose if you are starting from the bottom up. So I mean, that would be my thought. Uh, John, I don't know if you had some other thoughts as well. I think I think that's uh, that's fine. I, I, I could expound, but I'd probably just be rephrasing some of what you said. And we have uh, 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 two more questions here, which I hope we can get to um, them. Um, here's another question. Um, uh, these are bold messages. What kind of opportunities should we look for to deliver these messages? And you know, and that's a good question because we've said go say some pretty strong things to leadership, right? So uh, maybe we should uh, wax on the practical. I'll, I'll start with it, and Kelly, you can chime in. You know, from the practical standpoint, you're going to have uh, uh, update meetings on large projects. You're going to have. Um, uh, trip reports from conferences. Um, you're going to have uh, uh, diagnostics after projects are finished that, that went well or didn't go well. Um, uh, you're also going to have uh, uh, situations to address, uh, as Kelly remarked, external factors that are driving your need to manage data, compliance, et cetera. 
so when you have those opportunities is when that message gets delivered and it is now we have to make a conscious decision at this point do we just do a one-off focused application of data governance data management best practices and document the risks or do we start to build out whether it's bottom-up be provocateurs or be uh, uh, evangelical from the top down, do we continue to uh, uh, do, uh, build something of an enterprise uh, perspective? But these opportunities will present themselves, and I think you need to deliver repeated small messages. Kelly, any other thoughts on, on that? Yeah, no, I would absolutely add to that. And, and some of this is also your internal stamina to do that, right? So identify those existing communication channels and, and communicate your message in that way. Identify your provocateurs that you can uh, use to be your evangelist to communicate the same message. And so sometimes having this short but sweet vision statement means that you're all saying the same thing and you can tie back to and reference that vision statement over and over and over. And I'm going to use another example. So. I have uh, three kids, two of which, one is six and one is 12, and I swear they are the same person, but in a male and female body six, six years apart. And they, when they want something, they repeat it over and over and over and over, and I swear by the end, I ultimately agree, right? And I'm sure that you either have kids, brothers, sisters, anybody. The idea is, you know, repetition and helping to create some awareness by saying a consistent thing over and over and over regardless of the communication channel, right? What we're about, we're leveraging data for competitive advantage, and this is how we did that today. This is how we did it in this meeting. This is how we did it with this project, et cetera. So that consistency and repetition is very valuable as well. I like that. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Absolutely, there yet? right? Yet? Can I have yet? it? Can I have it? Can I have it? <laughs> we'll call that the, uh, the Bart Simpson technique. <clears throat> um, uh, okay. All right. Uh, one other uh, here I've got, um, and then if nothing else flows in here, we'll um, um, uh, uh, be able to do a, a wrap up here. Um, our organization has a training and uh, organization change department. Um, is this something they should be involved uh, in? And um, I think if the organization has that, uh, you've already got a lot of uh, of uh, stamina or po or potential there uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, uh, we've interacted with a few of those over time. Kelly, um, any examples come to like One recent example here in, in my town here in the Midwest where they had a lovely uh, group of uh, people that could facilitate anything and they were very, very, very helpful in building out a data governance program. Um, so yeah, there's, there are people whose, whose whole specialty is to get people to think differently, and I would certainly leverage those. Any, any thoughts on those? Yeah, and I think it goes back to what you just said, John. So some of this needs to be practical, and if you've got existing mechanisms within your company, do everything you can to leverage them, whether it's one individual who has a change management title, whether it is someone in marketing that does your internal communication. So whatever you have internally that is tasked with a similar sort of um, activity, leverage them. Get them on side. Use them also as your provocative. Tours, right? So I think that that's a great opportunity that you have and getting a wider net of uh, people that you can both go to for help as well as for um, dispersion and diffusion of the message, it's absolutely a great opportunity to take advantage of it. Cool. All right. I don't see anything that we haven't kind of maybe touched on a little bit already and we are getting near the end of our time. Uh, 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 once again, June 2nd, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, True Confessions from a Chief Data Officer. Ooh, I like that. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm going to kick it back to Shannon for the wrap-up, and I thank everybody for giving us an hour of their very busy time uh, to listen to us. We are always grateful for that, and we hope you learned something. Shannon? Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, John and Kelly, thank you so much for this great presentation, as always. Really appreciate it. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and, and submitting such great questions throughout. 
Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email within two business days, so for this particular webinar by end of day Monday, with links to the slides, the recording of this session, and anything else requested that was requested throughout. And um, yes, as John mentioned, June 2nd is the next webinar, and hope to see you all there. I hope everyone has a great day, and thank you very much. Thanks, John and Kelly.